message. Does anybody have one? Anything for, go ahead. Hopefully the trick-or-treaters all made it home safely yeah. and the adults made sure that their costumes were well, highlighted and well lit and yeah. everybody looked both ways across the street. Yes. So. <laughs> yes. Yes. Thank you. Motion to adopt the November 1st, 2021 agenda as presented. So moved. Second. Motion made by... Yes. You got him? Okay. <laughs> Thank you. And seconded by Lisa. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? All right. <laughs> Sounds good. Presentation of the high school new resource adoption for math and biology by Mrs. Uh, Dr. DeGraff and a teacher, I think there's, you have I'm guessing. I'm not gonna try to say, I'm sorry, I'm not gonna say your name. So you want, we wanna know how to pronounce For sure. Yeah. Oh, my. I'll introduce her in a minute. Yes. <laughs> You've never been asked that before. Never. 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 <laughs> All right, well, thank you and welcome. Tonight, we would like to share with you an update um, on two recent adoptions that we had at the high school um, in our core math and our um, in science. And so tonight, I have Dr. Tanya Wojohowicz here tonight with us, as well as um, two teachers um, that are implementing the curriculum as well. Um, in the schools, and so Tanya will also be introducing them as well. Um, but she's gonna, Tanya's gonna start by sharing with us a little bit about how um, we came together and developed a vision starting with math for what we want that K-12 math learner, um, what we want that outcome to be as they leave the school district of Janesville. Um, so this won't be new to you guys. You would have seen this vision of a math learner when we came last year to uh, um, present about the elementary school math adoption. Um, but at the time that we created this, we had a vertical team of people, K-12, as well as stakeholders come together and discuss um, what it is that we want for our students, not just in a curriculum and from a teaching and learning standpoint, but in their experiences, K-12 as they go through the school district of Janesville. Um, and so as you read those items on the slide, I just wanna um, re-engage you and remind you that you'll notice some of those things aren't necessarily just skills and content that we want kids to know, but we really want them to have some of the dispositional and soft types of skills that would help make them successful for college and career readiness, um, as well as just support and overall love and learning of math and the math content. So tonight we want to start with the adoption of our high school math um, core resources, which are a part of our integrated math one, two, and three and honors courses as well. Um, and so we have uh, Crystal Aileen here from Craig High School, one of our math teachers, who's going to share with you a little bit about the implementation. Um, one important piece as we shifted to a new resource and we had teachers as stakeholders involved in the process um, along the way, including we had Craig and Parker, as well as Rock University and Tagos, a part of this process and adopted the resource as well. Um, but what we, you know, really also we found our last math resource um, with tech book was specifically students could access the resources only digitally. So it was really important that we find a resource that had a hard copy text or student book as well, as well as a workbook and a digital copy. So they have access to all three of those resources in their classroom and that was really important to the math teachers as well, learning from previous experiences when just having a digital resource too. Um, so we are very excited um, to have um, our high school teachers as a really integral part of the process with this adoption. And so I'm gonna let Crystal go ahead and really talk with you a little bit about what does this look like in the classroom and what are our students doing? Hello. Um, to start with, um, these were kind of the things that we thought through as a high school team um, as to why Envision AGA was the way that we, we went through. So you can read through the, some of these items that are, are presented on here. Um, we also wanted to make sure that along with all of these things, we wanted students to be able to have an opportunity to not just 
understand the fluency of the math and be able to perform the tasks, but um, kind of get at the why of the math and kind of go at a deeper conceptual understanding and not just that procedural fluency. Um, we also wanted to make sure that our students um, that are in all of the diverse areas that we represent and we work with had an opportunity to access the information and, and get to the content level that they were in. So we were uh, making sure that we kept in mind our EL students. We were always um, in tune with our special education teachers. They were part of the process, um, our talented and gifted. Um, as, as you might know, we have a lot of tier two and tier three supports that we have. So it wasn't just a one size fits all. Um, we wanted to make sure that everybody was, um, every student was looked at to see if this was gonna be the right fit. So what does this look like in our classrooms? Um, we have a good balance between the procedural fluency, the conceptual understanding, and the application problems. So every lesson actually begins with a, in this example, an explore and a reason. So these are kinds of questions that are not necessarily, hey, do the math, let's get the problem done and move on. It's more about building a, an understanding from the ground up. We ask questions of students that are very entry level, and sometimes they have absolutely nothing to do with math. They just have um, getting you some background information about things and context that they can connect with right away before we get into the actual numbers, equations, and things like that. We do have um, manipulatives that we have available to us. Um, in our geometry books, we've been working with um, some actual constructions with physical things in our hands but we also do have access to modeling tools uh, digitally. So there are things that they can manipulate in the program. We also do have just, you know, some of those traditional straight up solve this equation, do this problem um, and kind of get those procedural things done. But finding the balance in this resource was something that was truly um, amazing to find and to be able to use. So another thing that this has, um, this program has that we've, we've been fortunate to work with is it's called Math in Three Acts. And so it takes um, a step from the actual process of doing a problem and gets into where might you actually see this? What could you actually connect this with and apply this to? So these are questions um, that take a day to go through. Um, you watch a video, you do some math, you have a conversation in small groups and you talk through some things that you, you see, you notice, you wonder um, to make a deeper connection to things. Um, you develop a model and you interpret the results. So it's really connected to those real life situations of things um, that sometimes historically we've maybe struggled to, to find and help students understand. Um, we do have access to the digital portal um, when it's working. Um, but having the physical textbook has been extremely helpful in the last week. Yes. Um, so students do have a physical hard copy textbook um, that you would normally see, you know, that um, have the examples worked out. They have um, the practice problems and things like that. They also do have a physical workbook student companion that has additional problems to try um, some teachers have been using that to take some notes in as well. So there's kind of a dual purpose with that. Um, other things that we can use in the classroom are a lot of our discourse strategies of how do we get kids to talk to each other in meaningful ways, make connections to things, um, and build that collaborative classroom environment. Um, and there's all of those tools within the, um, the textbook and the resource that we can use to get there. Um, there is also obviously time for independent practice. So while working in small groups and doing things together as a, as a team and in a classroom is great, there is also opportunities for students to do just some practice. So they don't, um, they're not missing out on those procedural things um, and only going to the application. And um, it's kind of that perfect balance between all the things that we would like to see our math students know and be able to do. I think that's it. Um, so just like a few years ago, we brought together a team of stakeholders and K-12 staff to build a vision of a math learner. We did that same process this summer before going into 
or excuse me, in the spring before going into adoption um, for our science resources. And so you'll notice up here again, um, a few different things and some that are similar to math. We want kids to enjoy and love and be engaged in science, but I'll give you a minute to quickly look at those items on the screen. And again, you'll notice that these aren't just content and skills we want kids to have, but we want them to have inquisitive minds and inquire about the world around them. We want them to have a joy and love and passion for learning science. And so it's important to us to always start with our why and our vision. And so as we went into our adoption processes, um, they all take multiple vetting stages um, and different people are involved along the way. We always start back here is what is it that we're aspiring to for our students? And these really become some of the considerations and or look fors um, amongst a list of many other things in, in adopting a potential resource. Um, so we're going to talk today about biology, um, both high school general biology and honors biology, as well as AP biology, because we did adopt new resources for um, both in the biology series. So this was the second largest adoption at the high school level. All of our freshmen take biology. So when we look at algebra, geometry, and ELG2, that's pretty much our course sequence for freshman to junior year, assuming that you... Um, went along in math unless you were a TAG student and had some sort of compacted option. Those were the three courses you would take um, unless you did some of the TAG options for math coming up. Every single freshman across this district takes biology. And so this um, resource is being used at both Craig and Parker as well as Rock University. I'll be introducing one of their staff members here to share with you um, in just a moment. And so when we adopted Inquiry Hub similar to AGA, there's both student tangible materials and teacher tangible materials as well as a um, digital option. And then for science, something that makes us unique is all the fun extra hands-on stuff beyond just the manipulatives that the math department gets. We get <laughs> tools, toys, and, and, and equipment. And so there were equipment purchases that went along with this as well as some consumables that would be annual as we would have with any science curriculum um, that we wanted to assure our teachers and students had to be successful with the implementation. Um, so we had another staff member who was going to be here tonight with Stephanie as well, and he is no longer able to attend, so I'm going to kind of hop in and out with her too. Um, but I do want to introduce to you Stephanie Viarello, who is here um, from Rock U, which is nice because you get to see the perspective of our charter schools as well and that coherence and consistency across the district. And she has so many amazing things <laughs> to share about her students and what they're doing. All right. So um, as Tanya said, my name is Stephanie Viarello and I teach at Rock University High School. And um, I came along for the ride with Craig and Parker in adopting Inquiry Hub or iHub. And um, you can see on this, on this slide why Inquiry Hub was chosen. These were the things as a science teacher uh, that we all want in our classes. So it was really important um, that our students have an opportunity really to engage in authentic science rather than just learning a bunch of terms, reading a textbook, and not really understanding the why and how this applies to them. So what makes iHub different is that they're able to uh, really engage in the science. There is inquiry um, in the lab. It's not just doing a lab exercise. Uh, They're oftentimes designing the lab. What do we know? What do we want to know? Um, how can we design something to figure out that, you know, what we want to know? And we, so we have some inquiry design going on, and then we get into the lab and we actually perform that. Then from there, we, um, after we have this in-lab investigation, then we have to analyze our data. So we bring that back, what we got, what all the other groups got. Um, let's look at this and see if we have any trends and we are charting this and we are graphing it and we are analyzing it. Was it what we expected? Was it what, not what we expected? Um, what would happen if we changed something else? And so there is definitely um, a true science experience, like a true scientist out in, in post-secondary and, and in uh, the industry. So they also had to be able to um, 
put together their results and communicate with with the group what they what they saw, what they observed, and also put it together and make it into a model. So rather than just being given um, graphs and, and charts, they're making them. And then they're explaining how this represents what they saw in the lab. So that is a truly um, amazing part of iHub. I think this is yours. Yep. <laughs> no, it's all good. Um, so the same thing is where the AP process starts as well. And for AP, like I have, we have both tangible materials as well as digital resources um, for our students. And so these were the reasons um, on behalf of the science team of why we chose Campbell's biology um, in focus. And so for AP particularly, it's important that students have an authentic command of the science, but at a collegiate level, but that it's also still accessible to a high schooler who may not be reading at a collegiate level yet. Um, and so we felt like this was a strong resource because it would help prepare students for the advanced placement exam, um, but it wasn't overly text dense. And that was something that was one of the challenges um, our, our students shared with us last time is just they felt like it was a lot of reading and heavy reading. And it's not that that's absent in this resource because informational text and reading it is something they do both in general biology and, and a lot in AP bio as well. Um, but it's just much more accessible and it also gives it to them in smaller chunks and then they do something um, with that information. Um, and so we do feel um, like this text helps support them being able to apply what it is they've learned at the level expected by um, the College Board and AP as well. And um, I got some feedback from the teachers and here's what they said their students liked. Their students find the descriptions for the science concepts really helpful. They felt like it was much stronger in this resource. Um, they liked the review questions, particularly because they felt like they reinforced the concepts and practices that AP is designed to teach. And so all along, not just as a summative unit assessment, but built in over time, they're getting more exposure to AP style and AP rigor questions. And so it's just additional practice, both at daily in the classroom as well as um, additional for beyond that. And then they really felt like it complemented some of the classroom lecture and other activities that um, the AP and College Board um, curriculum expect our students to have coming out of, out of that class. Okay, so these are some examples of what iHub looks like in the classroom. So one, another nice thing about iHub is that, again, the students are creating the models. They're not just being get given the models. So this is an example, uh, student A and student B in this very first example, are how different students showed their thinking in, in different ways, but they still met the demands of the standards. And so they can, again, what makes sense in their brain. So teachers know that they truly understand it, not just in a, a black and white way, okay? And then the second, um, we also work together as a, a team in the classroom, just like scientists do, they collaborate. And we have an example, this is a co-constructed model where we worked with students, we broke apart into groups and this is dealing with um, antibiotic resistance and how we grew back, uh, we have bacteria E. coli and when antibiotics are given, what is happening to that population when an antibiotic is 99.9% .9 effective? It's not 100%. And so, um, mathematically calculating over time the population of that bacteria that is growing between dosages and then you give it a dose of medication and it drops the population down and it's kind of this dance back and forth between the antibiotic and the bacteria and so they um, worked in groups to kind of put that together and mathematically calculate what's happening and then we put it all together as a group after uh, a dosage a series of antibiotics what would happen to that population so to, uh, we collaborated together to figure this piece out. Go to the next slide. So these are um, some examples uh, from my classroom as well. So after we um, were studying some antibiotics, we were doing lots of research. So we learned about antibiotic resistance. They're looking, how common is this? We started with a case study. 
So we take a, a something that actually happened in the real world. We were looking at a little girl named Addie from Arizona, and she got very, very sick and um, due to antibiotic resistance. She had uh, MRSA. And what was happening, uh, why aren't antibi- or bacteria responding to antibiotics like they used to? That was the big, over, the, the big question. And so in that middle sample, we're growing some bacteria and we've got antibiotic discs in there and looking how antibiotics work with the different bacteria. Uh, we created a survey where students took it to family and friends out in the community and had them answer surveys about um, their behaviors of taking antibiotics and following doctor's directions and to get information. Uh, we went to the CDC website and did some research and see how common a problem is this. Again, just like um, scientists. And then when we put it together, we put all that information together. We said, this is a problem. How do we fix it? How do we get the word out that antibiotic resistance is a big deal and we're the problem and we need to fix this? What can we do to fix it? And so our, um, my students made infographics. And that example is an as an infographic, um, this actually isn't the, her final draft for this student, um, but an infographic on antibiotic resistance. What is it? How often does it happen? And what can we do or what can I do to help? And so this is something that they, they shared and um, were sharing with their families and that we created in the classroom. And that very last example is another investigation where they had to calculate all the data. It wasn't given to them. So they had to get all of the data. And once they had the data, they had to make the graph. So this is all um, student driven versus uh, the, as a teacher giving them everything. And then, OK, you know, explain to me what it means. No, they created it so they should know what it means. Oh, did I do it the wrong way? Oh. Yeah, we lost the pictures. All right, well, there's supposed to be pictures on here. Um, you have them. Okay, wonderful. <laughs> okay, so uh, again, this is a brand new resource. And so just talking about some of the things that, that I've heard from, from students and families. I have a student this year who took biology with me last year, um, but due to COVID and, and things, are, weren't able to finish out the semester, did some homeschooling, then came back and is now taking biology with me again. And she's like, Mrs. V, she's like, I like biology. She's like, I like biology last year, but she said this year is so much better. Um, because I've used case studies in the past and case studies is like giving their dessert first. You give them, rather than let's learn all these pieces and okay, let's talk about, um, how does this work in the real world? We give them the hook. We, we give them a case and that we're trying to find the answers to as scientists in the real world. And they are working right along with the scientists trying to figure it out. And so they get this, this hook with this case study that they're intrigued by. And uh, so it's just, they're very, very engaged. So we're, we're working with Addie and they're looking up, they're Googling Addie. Like, did she, did she die? That was their big one. Did she die? So because she's a real person, this is a real case. And so they're Googling that. They're looking up, we're talking about MRSA. Well, what is MRSA? And so they're Googling what MRSA is. They're looking at the CDC. As we're going, we're, I'm like, guys, we're going to get there. We're going to get there. So um, like I said, they're, they're really engaged and excited because it's real. It's not just a textbook that they're reading. Um, then also during parent-teacher conferences, I'm talking to some parents saying that um, their students are really excited about science again versus they weren't, they, they didn't really like science. I have a lot of students that come in saying like, science isn't my thing. I'm not any good at science. But this is so intriguing with the cases that it hooks them emotionally and that they are doing research in science and actually enjoying it or not really, this isn't hard, this is fascinating, this is interesting. And so we had pay, um, a couple of parents thanking us, uh, first of all, for talking about antibiotic resistance and getting uh, a current event, a current topic, and uh, learning more about it, but also uh, that their their kids are loving science again. So I thought that was, I, 
I've, that was a new experience for me, talking to parents in that way. So uh, this is, a, again, it is fun. I just want to, I also want to say that it's not just a fun curriculum. It is challenging. As you can see from those examples, there's a lot of math involved. There's a lot of graphing involved. There's analyzing involved. There's research involved. Um, on my, my student infographic, there are sources. They're having to go and dig out some sources for this information and correctly citing their sources of making sure it's a credible source, making sure it's timely, that it's less than three years old, because all this data is really important that it's timely. Um, and so, again, it, they have to collaborate. They've got to problem solve and working together. So it is, like I said, a real world um, science curriculum. I think that is all for me. Um, I do know too the other teacher had shared, he had parents sharing at parent teacher conferences, just the same thing, passion and love. Their kids are coming home and discussing science. In the beginning of this unit, I actually asked kids to go out and do some of the surveying you heard Stephanie talk about, but also just the discussion outside that has been really rich um, and fruitful and amazing were this person's words in classroom conversation. And some notices is that kids are going deeper, quicker, um, and that they're asking better or deeper scientific questions. Um, they collaborate to solve challenging problems that have implications beyond the classroom. And then the last thing that they shared, and I think often in the back of my head, is that vision of a science learner. One of the things we want our students to have is a sense of confidence and efficacy when it comes to seeing themselves as learners and as scientists in the classroom. Um, and so um, he talked about the potential for students who weren't always confident because they didn't have the right answer. And as you saw in one of the slides, you know, a science is about discovering and learning and reiterating over and over and over again. And so kids have um, many opportunities to revisit and clarify their thinking as they move towards scientific responses and they can show that thinking in multiple ways and so it's really become more accessible for students because it gives them a chance to demonstrate their learning in a way that makes sense for them and it gives us a chance then as educators to give better feedback and truly know if our kids understand what it is that they need to be able to um, know and do. So um, professional development um, when we adopt new resources is extremely important as we have teachers that are very much experts in their content and instruction in their classroom, but with new resources, as you can see, um, many times there um, you know, are many different components that they have to learn um, from in comparison to previous resources that they have used. And for many of our teachers, um, this has been the first time they've adopted a new resource since they've been teaching as well. So we used that time. You saw our complex professional development schedule in August. So that is where they spent anywhere from two to four days in training using these new resources as well. Um, and then there's ongoing professional learning throughout the year when we have professional development days um, embedded during our school year. They also meet um, with their content teams in professional learning communities where they um, look at student evidence and data um, in their professional learning community. Um, how are students progressing in the content and do we need to make any adjustments? Um, then the resource also provides, um, they have professional learning libraries for teachers to access as well as on-demand support. So a place where they can go for inquiries about the resource if they have further questions. And then something that we're doing K-12 is math learning walks. So when we adopt a new resource, um, Tanya at the secondary level with um, our director of secondary and principals will go into math classrooms as well um, and to see and support implementation. So during the math walks and as we get further um, along in the math walks, we also have teachers become a part of the process as well. But they really look at how are we implementing the curriculum? What's working really well? And we want a message to teachers. What's the strength that we see? Um, you know, what is working well? And then what are some areas to grow? So what are some things we continue to support you with, whether it's more professional development or um, other things we think might be important to focus on in the resource as well? So it's, it's learning walks are a great opportunity to find out what's really going well and give that feedback. And then what are areas we can continue to grow?
Um, so part of our district work has been really looking at how to have a quality adoption process to assure that we're getting the best resource possible on behalf of our, our students. And it's not something our teams take lightly. We know that there is a financial investment. This is one of the ways we give back not only to our students and children, but to the community and assure that our kids are college and career ready and ready to contribute um, and, and really hopefully have opportunities to help realize their dreams and goals. And so many of these um, vetting things that are taking places are happening four more times. There's four more different vets for every resource, four plus. Um, so it's not something that's taken lightly. You can see on the page the entire team coming together, um, representing various groups and constituents and stakeholders to make sure that we are looking at it from all angles to not only serve the needs of our children in the classroom, but our community at large. And so as we look at the high school adoptions this year, these are some themes that really resonated both for math and science um, for our students that our team really wanted to um, share with you. And so um, even though, you know, the lens each team took was very disciplinary specific, at the end of the day, these are really what our resources are doing. They're engaging our children, and we're hearing and seeing evidence of that. Um, they're providing access for all students to be able to not only um, understand the content, but to be able to read the content or demonstrate their understanding of the content. Um, it's going a lot deeper, as you noted in both um, what Crystal shared and Stephanie, they're having to apply um, to real world scenarios. And so now we're making it much more authentic. And when we think of the types of careers in this area that employers um, have that our students will be filling, those are things that they're going to be doing when they get um, into, into the workforce, whether it's right after school or they choose to go on to some sort of post-secondary schooling, trade, military, whatever, they're still gonna need those skills. Um, and it provides a one-stop shop. We didn't want a place where kids are going all over the place or staff is having to go look and create things on their own. Like if the resource is doing its job as intended, staff doesn't have to run all over and get stuff and they can focus on what's most important and that's teaching and learning and the children in their classrooms in front of them. And so, um, you know, through, through the lift of the team and the adoption process, getting feedback from our children, this is just something we felt really um, resonated with us about the resources um, that you guys got to hear about tonight and, and hopefully will be true of the ones coming down the pipe. Like as I look back to last year's adoption and some of the initial groundwork and laying that, I think these are things that have always been in the forefront of people's minds. We hear our board speak to these things of what they want for our children too. And so just that process is helping make sure that that vision is, is living and breathing in our classrooms every day. And then the other thing I would just say is really um, not just that rich experience and the depth, um, but really, again, that it's about all students. And when we say all in Janesville, we mean all. That every single learner that steps in this classroom has a right to a guaranteed viable um, curricular opportunity. And we want all of our students to leave with all of those items on that vision list. And so, you know, going back to that whole idea of access and engagement and that wraparound process, whether it's through the vision or whether it's through all the representations on the different committees that vet our resources, at the end of the day, it's because we want to make sure that that all students in our classroom means all students in our in our classrooms. So oh, as we close today, um, we also just want to be honest that there's always challenges too. So we know that obviously COVID-19 has created challenges when you're trying to use new curriculum and, and trying to be cognizant of those health and safety procedures as well. Um, also in any new resource, it takes a lot of time and preparation and especially in our math and science content as well, where you have a lot of hands-on manipulatives, a lot of equipment you have to get ready for labs as well as learning the new resource. And also, you know, how are we gonna take that resource and ensure that our students um, that need enrichment or our students that need reteaching and support are also addressed during that time. So it's just challenging within the school day to be able to really prepare um, for that new resource as well. And then just like everything else, we've had delays with our equipment and our shipping and our resources. So we're not any different than um, many other businesses as well, but it has created some challenges for us. Um, and so really when we talk about any of our resource adoptions, um, and Tanya mentioned this, it's really important that we think about that word coherence because we want our students to have a high quality experience with a resource 
um, that supports our, our teachers in the classroom to really deliver instruction um, you know, that really helps our student achieve at higher levels. And so whether I'm at elementary in the Bridges math classroom or walking into the high school math or science, I can walk into one ninth grade classroom and walk out and walk into another and almost see the same lesson continued. So I know that we're guaranteeing that all of our students have that common experience that we feel is very important and is going to push the rigor into the classroom. And so I just wanna thank Tanya and our teachers here tonight and you can see from their excitement, um, you know, that we've really adopted a resource that is meeting the needs of our students and just want to thank them for the, the time and work that they've put into to making all of this happen as well. Um, and one other piece that we didn't mention, but along with assessment as well, we really, in the resources we've been adopting and um, specifically at high school, um, as the teachers look at the assessments, we looked at assessments that also mirror some of what does the ACT look like too. So our kids are having that experience as part of this resource um, as well. They create other assessments as well and there's other multiple assessments within the resource, but we want them to have that experience before they get to the ACT test as well. So that was another important piece as we look at that coherent experience for students. So thank you and um, I'll take a minute if you have any questions. Thank you so much for your presentation. I just really was impressed. I have um, a student at one of the high schools in town and um, a biology student. And so it's a full circle moment because I've heard her talk about many of these things and um, not to hurt anyone's feelings, but she's really loving biology this year. Um, so I think you're, you're right on there. Um, one of the things I was wondering as we were talking about curriculum changes and when was the last time that um, these updates were made in our math and science programs? Do, is that anything real recent or has it been a long time? Some of them have been forever. So I, I'll be honest, I was here in 2002 as a classroom educator in the physics textbook that they have in their hands right now is the same one that was year one my first year in this year. Okay. And so part of what's really awesome about um, iHub and some of the resources coming down is that um, because they're open education and because they are um, digital, oh yeah, I'm so sorry. There we go. Um, but part of what I think makes them exceptional, particularly in science, where there's often advancements and changes, sometimes minute by minute, is we're not looking at a resource that is arguing whether Pluto is a science, uh, is a planet or you know a moon or whatever. They're updated live time all the time. Um, and because the consumables come out afterwards, they're updating the consumables as well. And so sometimes um, in the past, when you do an adoption, you sit with a resource in front of you and suddenly it's out of date, but the information within is out of date. And that's even though they're updating it, the company's sending out all this stuff. Um, but fortunately, in the situation of our resources now, those are coming live time. And so if students are always having what's most up to date um, and well informed, as is our staff. And so I think that's just one, um, one benefit to, to them. Not all of our resources um, are that old. I know math adopted. Well, the math yeah. adoption had been about 20 years prior. Um, and so when, it, when I started in this role a few years ago, so that's when we looked at tech book because it really aligned with our standards and our curriculum. But when we quickly realized that some of the access for our students and teachers with just the digital resource, so that's why we made an adjustment this year too. But um, it had really and been um, many years before they had had a new adoption of the resource. That doesn't mean that teachers were, were not working together and updating their own resources and materials, but as far as something that brought that coherence together, um, you know, it's, it's taken some time. And so that will lead to an additional conversation we have with the board about reinstating a new resource adoption cycle so we can continue to make sure we have the most up-to-date resources. Okay, that's good. Yeah, I, I was just wondering, because I know always, 
in education world, the topic of do we have to keep changing curriculum every, and obviously that simply has not been the case. (laughs) So I am grateful to know that there are these updates and that you all have been working so hard. I really, I mean, we really do appreciate all of the efforts that have been going on. It's great to see these examples. I think it's really valid to know. I love knowing that Rock, you and Craig and Parker, there's that um, cohesiveness, which I think is important because I think often families might expect that our curriculum would be in line regardless of what school our students are attending. And if that's not happening, um, you know, we want to make sure that we're, we're having some semblance of similarity for sure. But this is great. And I think as we learn, for example, if something's working so well in somebody's classroom, that can obviously then be shared and extrapolated throughout the district for same um, high-powered approach. So that's fantastic. I love hearing how multiple learners, AP, um, the honors, the standard course that we're all having these updates done. Um, I have a lot of thoughts, but those were just some things that I think were coming to my mind to begin with, um, I will pass on to someone else so I don't keep rambling here, but thank you for your work. Um, You actually brought up to my attention one of the questions I had in regards to the adoption cycle. Would the board be able to see what that adoption cycle looks like in the forthcoming, whether it's elementary, middle, or high school, so we could get that 30-foot overview of where we are in the process instead of having to, you know, ask, you know, when, when was the last physics back in 2002. It kind of would provide that timeline for us as a board to move forward with future curriculum adoption. So that was just, thank you for touching on that. Um, I want to go back to biology. I don't think I had the same experience at Craig High School when I was a student there, but um, thank you for your energy and passion. I particularly, as a past classroom teacher, appreciate hearing from both of you. So I know it took time out of your day, so I just want to say thank you. And I appreciate the fact that you give us that classroom perspective as to what you're actually doing in the classroom. I really do appreciate that. In addition to the fact that I appreciate the heavy lift, a new adoption and a new curriculum, it's a heavy lift. A lot of professional development. We saw the schedule that Allison put together for you. Um, It's not easy. So I, again, just want to say thank you for that. And I do have a question in regards to, you had mentioned that you had some additional equipment purchases for perhaps the science. Could somebody just kind of give me a few examples of what those purchases might have been? Well, mine are probably different than Craig or Parker. Again, I teach at Rock University High School. We're located, obviously, at Blackhawk Technical College. And um, as an instructor there, with our memorandum of understanding, we are allowed to use Blackhawk Technical College's labs. So... I use all of BTC's facilities, and I'm allowed to use their equipment, and we use um, their chemical storage, all of those things. Okay. Well, um, being a technical college, they don't necessarily have some general, they they actually don't, they're working on creating a general biology course. They're very specific. So this first unit with microbiology with Addy was great because they have microbiology course, so I was able to have all of that, that wonderful equipment. Um, but for some of these labs coming forward, they don't necessarily have maybe a water bath and they don't necessarily have, because they don't, they don't need it for microbiology and they also didn't need it, don't need it for general chemistry. So I didn't have it. Um, BTC doesn't have it. So we're making those sorts of, of purchases just to kind of fill in any of the, the holes that between uh, the BTC labs and the equipment that we already had. So those are the purchases uh, that we made. We were given, uh, Tanya and um, the team did a really great job going through all of the curriculum and seeing all of the consumables and the equipment that were going to be needed. That was sent to us. So then it came to the teachers. Again, this is truly a, a team effort. So I had this huge spreadsheet. And so I went through BTC's labs and through my equipment. What do we have? What do we don't have? What do we need to order? And so we went through that list to make sure that we had the the supplies to make it through with this curriculum for this year. And then after that, then it's just those small consumable sort of, of, of things that like in any course that you would just have to purchase from year to year. Okay, thank you. And the, the reason we audited is because we wanted to be um, 
questions. Okay. The reason we audited is a couple fold. One, obviously fiscal responsibility first and foremost, you know, um, and it looked very different in different buildings pending um, many things over the course of time. And so there were places where people were sharing equipment and there were places where we had absent equipment. And so, you know, we really were trying to um, make a concerted effort um, for educational equity that everybody had access to the items that they needed to be successful. And so our team basically looked at year one, what would we need to implement with an average number of students? You know, year two, what would we need to say from a consumable standpoint? And then we also looked at, is there anything we're using right now that we're just kind of limping along and keep throwing band-aids on that, you know, just really is, it's, it, it's more of an investment to keep trying and fixing it than it is just to replace it at this point in time. And so, um, you know, so the team did that lift across the board. Everybody was kind of all hands on deck. And so it does look very different at each school, kind of what they needed um, just by virtue of, you know, some of our departments cross share. So like the glassware they're using in chemistry, they might be using in bio, um, you know, and then the consumable pieces that everybody would be getting are, you know, you saw the, the um, Petri dishes. So inside is some agar. And so we have to, you know, you have to buy agar to pour in the plates to solidify to do bacteria cultures. And those are things we've always had in use. Used, um, but that we would additionally be using um, as a consumable in this curriculum as well. And then just my last comment, and I know people might joke about it, but I particularly want to have a different focus on it. I do appreciate the fact that you have textbooks in addition to the digital, not for the reasons we're all shaking our head, but just because of the fact that we have different types of learners and somebody might not always necessarily be visual and can learn necessarily on a monitor, but they actually want to turn the page and make notes. So I just appreciate that so that you are covering all the different types of learners in your classroom. So I, pre I appreciate it for that particular point. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> these, does the transition from Bridges to Envision AG, that's, that's good, right? From so K-5 is Bridges and then 612? Or is it just high school um, is envision? Six eight is open up, but yes, I mean you bring up a very important point and something that we really try to make sure that K twelve there's coherence among the resources that we select, and so the shift in um, instructional practices, you know, um, as Crystal brought up, you know, you really want that balance of conceptual math and understanding and real world application, but we also need to have, you know daily practice too and procedural math. And so Bridges has that balance and so so do they at 912. So Tanya, and that's really important in having a K-12 math science coordinator, that she is a part of the process at every level. So making sure that whatever resource we're adopting, we're building that connection so that as they leave elementary, go into middle and high school, they're having a similar type of experience with the Okay, thank you. And what you actually see um, on the board here is our definition of what we say when we mean coherence. And so when we do um, rounds of the vetting, it starts and ends with a K-12 committee always. And one of the items that they're looking for is what you're asking about vertical coherence. And so for instance, whether you walked into an elementary, middle or high school classroom, you will see teachers asking, what do you notice? What do you wonder? because that notice and wonder um, instructional routine is universal in math. You'll see examples of students um, going independently first and trying and then pair sharing and then the teacher gets involved and they do kind of a group discourse and the teacher you know, starts doing the modeling and things like that. And so regardless of which classrooms you would go into, there is progression in our resources right down to literally the models within them. And so in Bridges, for instance, our kids use um, open-ended double number lines, which they still use in middle school, but those turn into tape diagrams. And then those tape diagrams as they go on to the high school um, continue in the progression. And so um, they're intentionally aligned. Um, and it is one of the specific things that did remove items from the vet that were quality resources as well, but it wouldn't have provided the vertical coherence and transition okay. for our students. Thank you. Um, I saw there's math, learning walks only in math. What about science? Yeah. Um, so I do site visits at all 21 schools um, quarterly and trimesterally at the elementaries, and I visit all of their classrooms. And so right now, um, we built the process with 6-8 um, three years ago. 
And so our teachers actually at the middle school do them very independently and then we all come together. Um, I loved hearing you share some things because it made me think we do an assets-based model where we look at what are our strengths and how do we take the next step and build from there. Um, and so at this point, um, elementary last year started those for the first time and some of the schools were able to bring people along somewhere with COVID. Also this year still, we have subbing challenges at times that prevent teachers from going. And so um, we've just tried to be really mindful about rolling them out slowly. I know that there's other content areas that have talked about um, doing learning walks. Um, but in lieu of learning walks, the thing that's important to us still is our teachers aren't in the absence of getting feedback. And so we still have um, other ways of giving our staff feedback, both at a building level, as well as some of the stuff that I work with our academic learning coaches. Chris does some things as well, um, you know, when we're in team meetings across the district to still make sure that we're implementing. We had surveys that go out at all levels. Actually, biology just got done filling theirs out. And, I was working on those today, the results of those. And so, you know, we're trying to keep a close eye on um, our staff and our staff's perceptions and what it, you know, those challenges and barriers and obstacles are that we can help remove, but also how to help keep moving them forward um, and growing collectively and individually as classroom teachers when it comes to some of those instructional and learning shifts. I understand that, but I guess I'm very concerned if we aren't doing science learning walks. We've paid a lot of money for the curriculum. We've spent a lot of time in PD. I want to make sure it's consistently implemented. So I'd be very concerned if that's not being done at the high school for both. So um, please, if I could just, I would like to have somebody make time for that. Um, I think it needs to be done. Um, to -do -do. So are these adoptions shared? across other subjects and I ask because at Craig I'm on the PTO and we were looking at a grant and the tech ed tech teacher asked for a grant on a program and in his his or her case was it's really going to help with math skills that the students will need going into the real world so do you in does the does a um you know, academic learning coach, do they kind of share that across to make sure like he's not, yeah. he or she's not getting a program and spending time on something that is not even the same methodology yep. of these? Um, so yeah, our ALCs at every level are involved in the vetting process and they'd serve that lens. I also help serve some of that role as well as some of our staff. And so for instance, and I'll speak just to math and science, being the math and science coordinator, there's a science um, practice in the standards that is all around math computation and computational thinking. So you saw students creating the graph that Stephanie had showed you and doing some graphical analysis as well. They walk into a chemistry class, they're gonna be doing you know, um, single digit solving equations that have a single variable, those types of things. And so um, the, the standards themselves actually have a little Venn diagram. So three circles that overlap and two of the circles that overlap are math and science. If you actually pulled up a Wisconsin state science standard, you could find the associated ELA and math standards that go with it. Um, so they've kind of done some of that lift for us, at least um, through that science realm, which is nice. Both math and science have practice standards that are very similar um, and overlap with each other. And a lot of it just revolves around the idea of critical thinking and um, using and applying information in authentic context. So think, know, and do like a mathematician. Think, know, and do like, like a scientist. Um, the other piece that addresses that as well is we have a pretty rigorous curriculum writing process um, that goes along with it. And so um, biology started that process, for instance, at the beginning of this year. Math did that process at the beginning of this year. And at the end of this year, um, our math team um, courses will come together, as will life science or biology courses, and they'll do the curriculum scope and sequence, and they identify priority standards. Um, and those are where the focus or about 80% of our teaching and learning and instruction um, need to focus on. Those are the biggest skills right. for college and career. So they right. make sure that they're being hit. Yeah, I, if I understand the standards and, and that, I guess my question is, do, does tech ed know there's a new math adoption? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, okay. They do. So, and, and like you said, it's, a part of the principal, the academic learning coach. And so Perfect. if that's something that Tech Ed wants to adopt, yes, that should be something that 
has consideration from other departments and team members. Okay. Yeah. We haven't approved it yet. That grant specifically yeah. just came up today, so it's, oh, it's fresh in my mind, but I'll ask, make sure Dr. Bion looks at that. Um, so uh, I wanted to clarify something that you had said, Lisa. So the schedule that you're asking for, I'm not sure how much value it is to see when the last one was done, but do you mean what's the coming up, yeah, right? what's the coming up. So the we've historical? had that before. Um, I think maybe a refreshed version of where what was recently done by your team and then what's yeah. coming up. Within the past two years, we've had recent a cut, adoption. Right. Yeah, mm -hmm. so Just refreshing that yeah, one that's got all the bars. That, yeah. yeah, there's one, yeah, the different phases. That'd be great. And then um, I think for the whole board, actually. Yeah. Yes, um, to plan. Steve and I have been... It's on the agenda for next week. Well, there we go. Look at that. <laughs> okay. And then my last question is, um, the science really got me thinking about, is a community member involved in this? Now I think about the sciences industry is coming to the area, and are we bouncing these off of them and just saying, hey, look what our kids are doing? Um, maybe in any way, I, I'm not sure what engagement we're able to have right now. Is that happening? Sure. Um, I definitely agree that that's an important, you know, piece to consider. And there, there are pieces of that, but it, um, I definitely feel that we need to build that further. What we are working on is pathways um, and really looking at our pathways at the high school level. So part of when we're looking at those pathways, we're looking at what are university expectations if I choose to do a health science pathway? Um, or what are technical college, or what are careers. And so we are engaging with, with um, colleges and technical colleges and people out in the field to find out you know, what do they need um, for a student when they graduate going into this field. So we're engaging in that way, but not specifically um, in looking at the actual resource, I guess. Yeah. I just think like Stephanie, you're really close to BTC and then you know you've got, but um, it'd be interesting for some of the business people to see what this new curriculum adaption means for what we're putting out and our, what our students are learning and what they're going to be able to do. So I know nobody's got an excess of time, but I just think that would be really important. So, hey, thank you very much. Yeah, it was a lot of good work. And I definitely recognize all the, as well, all the work that the teachers do. Thank you. Thank you. All right, 1.5, presentation on updated school calendars for 2022 to 23 and 23 24 by Mr. Garner. Thank you, Commissioner Hayworth. Um, Dr. DeGraff, myself, and uh, Chris Menowalt have been working on um, a different model for calendars. I know we have already uh, calendars approved. Uh, we went to the board earlier and got the two year calendars approved, but we're asking for your blessing to get new calendar reapproved, a different type of calendar. And the reason why is we're finding uh, the feedback that we have in our current model uh, with 10 days prior to return it and putting all of our eggs in that basket for PD and getting ready for school. Um, it, it's not working. It, it's not effective when, it, when we come to ongoing learning uh, for our teachers in terms of adoptions, in terms of other things that we need touch points throughout the year, especially with the COVID that it highlighted the fault of the calendars that we had. We, we, we intended it to be a good calendar and it did work because we wanted people to leave earlier in the summer. <clears throat> but as we're, as we're getting the feedback and we're looking at the different pieces that we need for our kids, we feel like we need those days spread out throughout the year. And so in order to do that, we have to present to you a calendar that uh, has 10 PD days. Uh, we're going to create models. We had them, obviously, with all of our technological issues. We have to, we have to bring it to you during to the board meeting if you're willing to give us that permission to do so. Uh, the goal is really w with the new calendar would be, you know, job embedded professional uh, development learning throughout the year. We'd still look at that, you know, the third week of March for spring break, which is a board goal. MLK day would certainly be another uh, non-student day. We'd want to work on our PLCs, um, and we definitely want to work on consistent PD days between the high school and the elementary, so that helps our community out as well, so we don't have to worry about babysitters and, and whatnot. Um, go yeah, ahead. I was just going to add, as, as you mentioned, as you just saw the heavy lift with these new resources to only have two days during the year. And then the other challenge that we run into is that 
with the sub situation. So right. we can get subs sometimes for the teachers, but we end up canceling all the time because we don't have subs. So it's an option, but not really a very effective option. So that's part of Yeah, and we're working on our sub uh, situation yes. as well. We're trying. <laughs> we're doing what we can to entice people. Um, so just with this committee's blessing, if you don't mind, we'd like to bring a new model uh, calendar to our next board meeting. To Tuesday, sure. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. 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 Um, yeah, sir. I just appreciate you pivoting and yeah. it's not working. So just don't, mm -hmm. yep. So just don't, yep. You learn and you revisit and you make it better and move on. So I just wanted to thank you for being honest, saying it's not working, it's not being effective and, and pivoting and bringing something forward that might be more effective for our teachers and students. Yeah. And, and, and thank you. And, and just as background, we have receive feedback uh just so you know we glean feedback from our, our administration of principals our teachers I've, i meet with the union on a monthly basis so they're, they're aware of this it's been talked about for a while mm -hmm. so um just so you know that yeah. that's that's Sounds also good. been done okay sure and kathy i'm sorry i forgot to see if you had any questions on the resource adoptions that sorry about that okay Okay, sorry about that. Thank you. Uh, 1.6 staffing and substitute update, Mr. Garner. Yeah, thank you. I think Denise gave you a copy of, of our new chart. One of the things that it doesn't show and I, I will ne do next time uh, is kind of compare where we were in August mm -hmm. to now. So I do have some math for you. Um, so it's a bunch of numbers, essentially. But what we had in, in August, uh, for example, for our teacher number of filled positions, we had 131 postings as of last August. Um, we had 121 filled. So essentially we had 7.6% of our positions filled in August. As compared to right now, we've had now 153 positions, or I'm sorry, 157 postings with 153 being filled. So we're down to now we filled, uh, we only have 2.5% of our positions unfilled for teachers right now. So that gives you some perspective of how as we as the year moves on, we kind of balance out and steady ourselves when it comes to hiring, especially in a, in a crazy hiring environment that we're in. Um, so that's for our teachers. For our paraprofessionals, uh, as of August, we are at 82 postings. We had 26 positions or 31% of those positions open. Um, right now, we've had 141 uh, postings with um, only 21 unfilled. So we've got, we're down to 14% unfilled, which sounds like a lot still, but we also know that our paraprofessional uh, situation is, is something that we have to work on. And so we're developing a plan uh, to address those as well, to, to address that. So just kind of give you some perspective on those things. Mm -hmm. One thing that you're going to notice in January, um, you're going to see a spike in our teacher uh, postings in our open positions. And that's part of the language right now that that the board allows a semester retirements. So you're going to see a spike in that, but I do believe that we're working on some, uh, a fix for that, a fix for that as well. So you'll, you'll hear more about that in a little bit. Questions for me on that. Anything? I appreciate the comparison. Yeah. I, you know, I should have, I'll do that next time. All right. I just, yeah, I asked uh, Mr. Gardner to do this for our meetings so we can keep a pulse on because we are, PPC or the personnel, personnel policy or the committee. Yes. Yeah. yeah, I was like, personnel it's one of them. Personnel is part of our job, right? Yes. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, yeah. I just, um, man, I, I know how impossible it is to deal with all of this hiring and finding people when there's nobody out there. So thank you for, um, and all of the schools that have been dealing with the shortages because it's, you know, we all feel it. And um, I just um, thank you for staying the course and trying to um, get creative. <laughs> well, thank you. Uh, I will tell you that our, our teacher positions right now that are unfilled are 95% uh, of them are special education positions. Mm -hmm. So uh, it, it's just uh, the way of the, the world right now. So. All right. Thank you. This is helpful. All right, I don't have any announcements or updates. Does anybody have anything? Mm -hmm. And then our next meeting, I believe you were I, not able to. I can, I, should I go back on this now? <laughs> I can make that January day. I looked at my schedule and I wasn't sure I could make that Tuesday work. And then I think our conversation kind of didn't continue. But um, Denise, do you remember? It was January. Are you talking about December 6th? I think we just, we're no. skipping that. We're going to skip that date. Okay. I think so. Yeah, we 
talked about. We talked yeah. about skipping that. Yeah. And then I had thought maybe I whatever, but I I can make that January date work. Um, so January fourth, I think it was. Yeah. Thank so, you for being flexible. Yeah, yeah. So Tuesday, January 4th at 4.30. I think Lisa might have been gone in December. Some, something yes, I'm gone in December. We canceled December, yeah, yes. or postponed. All right, if you have any topics for that one, let me know if anything sounds or anything you want to update on. All right, that adjourns our meeting. Thank you.